Hello everyone, this is Professor Alan Barrell speaking to you from Cambridge. And yesterday we had a wonderful time with the students from Anglia Ruskin University talking about money at their money festival. And here we are again and we're recording this talk so that more people can share it because the Anglia Ruskin money festival was a great idea of students to cause us to think differently about money. So we're now going to have some more thoughts on money, on wealth, on value and values related to people, related to life, related to art. We talk a little bit about banks, the evolution of money, and hopefully give ourselves some new approaches to thinking about this very, very big topic. We often hear it said, don't we, that money makes the world go round. And you probably hear people say from time to time, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I really think it's useful for you and I to think about those statements as we have our discussion and wonder whether we believe in them. Because we've got a chance for the next few minutes or so to think a bit differently about money and its importance, about facts, about fault, falsehoods maybe, and a little bit about the history of money, but human factors particularly. Creativity, imagination, value and values, wealth and poverty. Because let's face it, it's very common to value people, to value companies and nations in financial terms. And we make a lot of assessments of success and failure based on financial measures. So I don't have a lecture here. I have a sharing of some thoughts and some stories. And I invite you to open your mind to the subject of money. What is money? The dictionary says that money is any item or verifiable record that is generally accepted as payment services and repayment of debts, maybe taxes, in a particular country or socio-economic context. But surely money is much more than that. What other thoughts do we have? We have factual thoughts and fantasy thoughts about money, I think. What does money mean to you? Does it mean cash, notes, coins, credit, savings, security, debt, value, currency, your status, your importance? Does it mean yearning? and envy for things that maybe you don't have. And what about this other word, wealth? The dictionary tells us that wealth is a plentiful supply of a particular desirable thing. So think of health and wealth and relative values of health, wellness, sickness. Think of malnourishment. Wealth is very much more than money. And then consider art. Nature, natural beauty, happiness, fulfillment, life. What can be bought and sold? What can't be bought and sold? And we all know that there's a lot of criminology going on related to money. And we live with it, but I'm not going to talk about it today because I don't have time for that. Most people, if you say money, might conjure up these images. And yet... In growing numbers of locations, we don't do payment by physical money, do we? It's changing. The world is changing. And we'll talk some more about that later on. We're going to look at the history of money and where it came from. But before we do that, I have a few words of context. Because I think we might have other words that come out when we think of money that we haven't mentioned yet today. And here's a few of them for you. Needs and wants, very powerful words. Enough, poverty, well-being, satisfaction. You can read them all. I won't read them all out. To win, to accumulate, to lose, to desire. The language of money is pervasive and it influences how we value much in life. But I want to put things in human context before we go too much further and remind us that this is the context of our discussion because prosperity and poverty are very different ways of life. The human condition 
is not the same all over the world. Now, many Chinese people live in cities like Shanghai, and many other people around the world live in urban centers and modern cities with many, many wonderful things at their disposal. And we should remember that China, in four decades, lifted no less than 800 million people from poverty to a better life by creating wealth and distributing it. And yet, in Bangladesh, we find today people from Burma, the Rohingya people, refugees with no real homes living in camps like this. We can't overlook these realities of life. Human values cannot all be measured in monetary terms. And perhaps this picture helps us distinguish between wants and needs. It's very hard for me to imagine how people in situations like this, not just the little ones, but the adults, think about money. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are at least 15 million malnourished children. It's a terrible situation. So these are just some reminders that thoughts and discussions about money, wealth and value are very greatly influenced depending upon where we find ourselves in the world. And from one extreme to another, here is a Rolls-Royce car. Think about how different people in different parts of the world think and value money. Needs, wants, priorities. Where do thoughts of money fit in? What about status, ego, lifestyle? These are just some more thoughts. Because some people, being seen driving in a Rolls-Royce, will feel very proud. They will feel they are of great worth and value. They will be proud of having accumulated wealth. I'm not saying that's wrong. But maybe they have feelings of success that lead them to believe that they are superior as people. Something to think about. Now, <clears throat> on the basis of what we think about money, here is a very good friend of mine, a young lady, Georgina who had a very, very excellent job in Parliament, very well paid, very high status, very high caliber, very well educated. But she wasn't satisfied with what she was doing with her life. And she moved to Cambodia and she started a charity. Before she went, she completed a one year postgraduate diploma in entrepreneurship at the Judge Business School because her trip to Cambodia was a call to adventure. She had seen a lot of suffering there and she wanted to do something special to help the people there. And she went and she founded a series of cafes that also provide books that she collects from around the world. And they also educate people in how to start companies. She raised more than 200,000 pounds to get that thing all started. And it's now a great success. Money, of course, was not her main reason for going, but she couldn't go until she would got the money. And here's a, another heroine. A lack of money didn't stop this lady, Teresa, Mother Teresa, from spending her life supporting sick people in India. And my question for us all is how do we measure the value of this kind of dedication? We'll come back and think about how the world in some parts of its uh, territory is helping the poorer people. But let's look at a little history. So when we look at the history of money, we find that in the early days, there was no money, but people found a way to exchange things. We called it barter. And there's the progression of the history of money. Gold became very important, then coins, paper, plastic, electronic money, and cryptocurrency. Now, the one thing we can say for sure about all of these systems is that they really only work if the parties involved trust each other. And we haven't said very much at the moment, have we, about what I call M money, the unseen money, the mobile device money. Is it money or is it value? Because it's more and more widely used today. 
We won't forget gold, however, because the gold standard is still very important as a reserve currency, and it's always there, like other precious metals, such as diamonds and platinum. They all have a lasting and intrinsic value. We'll come back to money in a little while, but let's just think for a moment about banks. And here's a little history. This is a gold medal issued in China. It's a 2001 medal commemorating the ancient walled city of Pingyao in Shanghai province in central China. And Pingyao uh, is certainly an ancient city. It's a walled city. When you go there today, it's a time warp. Although it's changing, there's a new station and the high-speed train now comes from Beijing and that will transform it, I'm sure, into something more modern. I was there a little while ago and it was a journey back in time. It is off the beaten track and when I was there, the local band were playing in the streets and you can see that it feels very much still like an ancient city, unchanged uh, from centuries ago. And in the 17th century, it was a very prosperous trading center where one of the very first unincorporated banks in China was formed. The Rish and Chang Bank and the ancient bank in Pingyao is still here. When you go and you can see it, this is the outside of it. This bank introduced paper money to replace the heavy silver that was being used as currency in those days because the heavy silver was very difficult to transport all over China and it was prone to robbers. There were many bandits around and the bandits had to be uh, fought off and that meant hiring a lot of very expensive guards. It was very inconvenient. So paper money was introduced and from this base, the bank which survived until 1913 became the largest bank of its time. And as you can see, it became international. If you go there and you go in some museum and the interesting thing is that it doesn't look very much does it different from those banks that we have been using until quite recently in the west so lots of banking practices were developed in those early days and here is a banknote which was issued by that bank this one was actually from 1911 whereas the first banknotes in china were done in the seventh century. This was a, uh, a Qing dynasty banknote worth a hundred taels of silver. But banknotes then have been around in China for centuries, and we know that they appeared in Sweden in the 17th century. But coins, of course, were in use much, much earlier. We think the first ones, perhaps 500 years before the birth of Christ in part of Greece. Now, I'm taking us very quickly on another journey to the frontier bank in Shenyang in Liaoning province, northeast China, up by the Korean border. And this is the banking hall in 1930. It was a bank owned by a very famous warlord, Marshall Chang. But if you go there today, it is now the museum of the financial world where they have an amazing collection of all kinds of things related to the history of finance. Here's me in the banking hall where I met some very interesting characters, as you can see. And if you spend a day there and you trundle around all the corridors, you will see some wonderful exhibits and the world's biggest collection of banknotes. It's a fantastic place to visit. So that was years ago, and that was banks. <clears throat> banks, of course, have developed, <clears throat> excuse me, around the world since that day. So what can we say about the banks today after all those years? They're not always helpful if you're trying to start a business, as some of you will know. And they've been through crisis after crisis, bad debt crises, booms and busts. They focused for some years on making money for themselves and profits rather than on the customer. And in 2000, uh, 2008, we know <clears throat> there was a very big financial collapse and governments such as the government in my country had to step in and bail them out. There have been property bubbles, there have been mortgage problems. 
And the greed and fear factors have had a lot to do with the way the banks have swung from one extreme to another. Greed and fear are human emotions that affect the financial thinking of people very, very much. So we ask the question, what are banks really for? And some people give an answer that says they don't seem to be so much focused on the customers these days. The way they've marketed themselves and the way they've attracted customers over the years has also come in for criticism. Here's one marketing of the particular point in time. And I'd like you to think about what your assessment of the ethics and morals of this marketing message was. This was a credit card which was launched in 1972 in the UK by the National Westminster Bank as a competitor to the Barclay card, which was the first such card and which you will all know has survived. The NatWest card didn't survive. But here is the message that they used to persuade people to use money that they didn't have in order to buy things that they really wanted badly, but they couldn't afford at that time. Takes the waiting out of wanting. Mm. That's a very interesting message, isn't it? Especially to young people who might not have any money. Think about it. Now, I have a question for you about something very important that happened in 1991 change and the financial situation of the world is managed but changed many many things and changed our lives dramatically and here's a clue and here's another clue Tim Berners-Lee 1991 have you guessed it was the birth of the world wide web it was the internet it changed the world probably more than any single invention or intervention that we can remember and it changed it very rapidly not only in finance but it did lead to the birth of a new industry sector that we now call fintech financial technology so it brought a revolution it brought online finance it brought mobile payments it brought big data it brought cognitive computing and with alternative finance we can now borrow money online we can raise money online by crowdfunding. We can get donations. We can get equity. We can do online banking of many, many kinds. And we don't always need the bank to get any. And then we'll come in a moment to something else that happened, blockchain. So there we are, big data, mobile payments, digital currencies, which we'll talk about. Cognitive computing, technology that's changed the world the fintech revolution, many new companies founded to develop fintech activities and apps. And of course, all of it is leading to the acceleration of our journey towards a cashless society. And China, in some ways, is in the lead on that because they have developed their social media so wonderfully. And I wonder whether there is a future for credit cards. So when we look at the world in those years since the internet, we see an amazing change and amazing development in the world of business finance. More power to the people. The Western banking system had failed us. Crowdfunding, impact investing. Microfinance, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. It led to a brave new world. And if you look at the equation at the bottom there, internet plus entrepreneurs equaled revolution in finance. And this was one of the people who was in the forefront of leading it because entrepreneurs do lead change. And Jack Ma in China said, if the banks don't change, we will change them. He'd already done well in growing Alibaba to a multi-billion dollar business. And his micro line business has lent to more than 500,000 small businesses. It has been a revolution. And of course, we have seen him form Alipay, which leads the mobile payments revolution. And just one look at how online finance has really taken off in China 
look at the progression of the amount of online finance up until the year 2017, and it's much more now. By 2017, at the end of that year, it was up to almost $400 billion US money being acquired online, not through banks and conventional means. And then, of course, along came the blockchain. Blockchain, it is said, is a system which records information in a way that you can't hack, cheat, or change the system. It's a digital ledger of transactions, and it's duplicated across the entire network. It is subject of a lot of research and publications. I believe it has applications and will have many more way beyond finance in maths, analytics, computer science generally, and elsewhere. And if you really want to know more about it, because there's not time today, have a look at the website of the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance, where you can download some very, very interesting blockchain benchmarking reports. And speaking of blockchain brings us, of course, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which are all based on the blockchain technology. But before we look at Bitcoin, let's define what we mean by currency. What is a currency for? A classical definition is, it's a store of value. It's a unit of account. It's a medium of exchange. So we have relative currencies. We have dollars, we have pounds, we have euros, we have yen, we have renminbis in China. And they are relative to each other and they value each currency, of course, is valued at different levels at different times. And that leads to all sorts of interesting issues when we think of international trade where money is changing hands. If the currency values vary greatly, it can lead to all sorts of difficulties. And of course, it's on the currency basis that we hyperinflation, disinflation. In the AIU festival, those that attend are going to talk about uh, disinflation and hyperinflation in much more detail. But my question for today is, is Bitcoin a true currency? And can we say the same of other cryptocurrencies? They're in the news today, but do they meet the criteria of a true country, or are they more a device to make a profit, buying and selling? Are they a trading device? Are they a store of value, a unit of account, a medium of exchange, or just there so people can make money? My own opinion is the latter. And the way the values are swinging up and down, if you look at the newspapers these days, I think supports my view. And I don't think that the cryptocurrencies are going to play an enormous part in the future of finance worldwide. Now, when we think of value and money, we must also consider the money that is invested in companies. The equity ownership is a very large part of the money of the world. It's where investors place their money. So values of companies are very important things. But valuing companies can be a risky business. Companies are bought and sold on the stock exchanges of the world. So relative value is an important thing. But we see, don't we, when we look back through even recent history, booms and busts, investors led by greed and fear, buying and selling shares on stock exchanges. And look at these examples. Just look at the top one. Bookham was launched with a blaze of wonderful publicity in April 2000, valued at 1.2 billion. A year later, the market valued it at only 231. This was the same company, the same people, the same products, the same market. Uh, you can look at the others, look at the last one, just two clicks. It didn't exist for much more than a year. Because rational financial thinking had gone out of the window when the panic to buy, driven by greed and the desire to make money very fast, overcame financial prudence. Before we leave the subject of digital technology, 
just a few words about another part of the revolution that has helped people who have been living in very poor countries. And this is a great hero. Mohammed Yunus, you may have heard of him. He won the Nobel Prize for the work he did on microcredit and microfinance. He founded the Grameen Bank to lend to poor people online. And many people said, hey, you're crazy. These guys will never pay you back if you lend them money. But they do, and they did. Certainly 95% of all the loans that Grameen Bank makes get paid back by poor people with interest. So he started something which now operates in over 100 countries, and there are certainly more than 10 million loans. And that was from one of the poorest countries in the world. And his example was picked up by another Bangladeshi man, Iqbal Qadir, who said, hey, my people are not empowered. They're run by a corrupt government. They really can't do too much about their condition. Many of them don't have any money. They don't have the means to communicate. And he said, I'm going to enable more of my people to be able to communicate with each other and to be empowered by enabling them to acquire at a very low cost a mobile phone. And I'm going to take money from the Grameen Bank and I'm going to start the Grameen Phone Company. And he said, think of this. If you find a hungry man and you give him a fish, you feed him maybe for a day. But if you teach him to fish, you might feed him for life. So in Bangladesh, the Grameen Phone Company was launched. Ladies in villages bought very low cost phones. They rented them out to other ladies in the village. The ladies in the village paid them a small amount for using the phone. The ladies that got the money accumulated enough to buy a goat and then another goat. So you can see how microfinance in Bangladesh actually helped communities to become at least a little bit more prosperous. A different subject now, are there strong connections between art and money? I think undoubtedly that there are, and that's going to be explored in other parts of the Anglia Ruskin Money Festival. But I've got a few thoughts here for you. Think about sponsorship money that goes into art. Think about the cost of art education, scholarships, art galleries, entertainment, design, architecture, the whole world of literature, the games industry and more. There should be in our minds, I think, a very strong connection between art and money. And let's face it, banknotes have an artistic beauty of their own, much beyond monetary value. You saw this picture earlier when I was talking about the Museum of Finance in Shenyang. Banknotes, beautiful, every one of them a little artwork and creative and colorful in its own way. The value and wealth, when we think about those words, also relate to owning great paintings, don't they? Works of art. Now, here's a famous work of art, the Mona Lisa. It's priceless now. And the artist that painted it is no longer a beneficiary of the value of the painting. But think of the world's fine art markets in the same way that you think about stock exchanges. They are trading in art and great wealth is required to own great paintings. Here's a lady who was born in Mexico in a very disadvantaged way. That was the period she lived. And she reminds us that science and business are not everything, and that art and creativity are a huge part of life. And Frida Kahlo brought to her country of Mexico wealth, Wealth that poured in because of her art. Wealth which benefited the communities around her. Sponsorship which was divested into different aspects of life. She was eventually acknowledged after a struggle in life. She married a famous artist, by the way. But she was very disadvantaged physically. She had polio when she was little. She was disabled for life and she had other terrible injuries. But outside of any considerations about money, she's a great example to us all of how adversity can be overcome and great things can come from very poor beginnings. There's going to be a lot more 
on money art in the money art festival in cambridge this year but i've just got one or two examples here that i think are interesting this man mark wagner and others create new images from money forms banksy is a famous artist who paints on walls in public places this is one of his artworks which depicts a, a coin of course and child slave labor so it carries a political message. And there are money artists that really take liberties with currency. Look at the images on those notes. And some of these money artworks become valuable collector's items. And in Cambridge, from which I'm speaking today, art and creativity are a very large part of life. And they do help to create a prosperous community. And we have the School of Art, which is within Anglia Ruskin University dating back to the 19th century. We have societies all about art, all adding something to the value of life and the well-being of the people of Cambridge. Cambridge is also a great center now for the computer games industry. Two companies, Jagex and Frontier, are getting a lot of money invested into them from Chinese sources, RuneScape, is one of the longest surviving computer games in the world. And at Anglia Ruskin University, we have a very special incubator called The Reactor, which is all about starting up new, new digital uh, computer art companies. So the computer games industry in the world of money brings money and technology by combining art, design, creativity, computer science, and many other technological elements and it's a great example of why we should all think very broadly about life and not just about business and money and that's the message of this man Alvar Alto a great designer and architect look what he said building art is a synthesis of life in materialized form we should bring in under the same hat lots of things not in a splintered way of thinking but all in harmony together art life and money great thoughts he had a life of creativity and he promoted thoughts about the value of a life balance work and play man he said is the eternal child very nice thoughts from alvar alto and here's a picture of one of the wonderful designs that he contributed in finland to the world of uh, architecture and his art and his design qualities brought wealth to him in a variety of forms. And it's wonderful to look at a picture like that and think about it enduring for very, very many years to come. And here in Cambridge, we have another example of a commercial operation, which is also contributing to wealth creation and to artistic endeavor. It's a chocolate company, Hotel Chocolat. It has a cocoa plantation and stores and cafes everywhere. So it's bringing food, art, design, and all those things together. It's creating jobs and wealth. And it's a wonderful example of how money can be used and thought about in a very broad way. So just to conclude, let me look ahead for a little while about the future of finance and money. I predict there will be a cashless society. There will definitely be the end of credit cards. And we are emerging into the age of fintech and big data. Of course, around the world, there are geopolitical uncertainties. We must hope that we find the progressive elimination of poverty. But I suggest we all need to think very carefully about redefinitions of what is true value Technology will take us upwards and onwards in the expression and movement of value and assets if we use it well. But human nature will not be rid of greed and fear. They will prevail. So look ahead positively. Expect the unexpected. Reimagining is absolutely likely to create great surprises. And digital technology in particular, together with quantum computing, is going to create for us a whole new world in which hopefully art, money, creativity, and entrepreneurship will change the world even faster. 
there's a lot to read about money in some of the books that some of us have written. There's just one here, which is very helpful for people who might be raising money to start and grow a business. It's also available in Chinese, published by the Tsinghua University Press. And that is the conclusion of my contribution today, which I hope has stimulated you to think more broadly about money. And I thank you very much for listening. As I say, goodbye for now.